Preparing food takes an amazing amount of attention to detail. Food is one of the great equalizers. It offers an incredible opportunity for laughter, for deep discussion, for contemplation, problem solving. When I am cooking, the goal is to have someone eat and have their senses awaken and take them on a journey to rediscover the dish each time they take a bite. Hi, my name's Eric Williams. I am the chef and owner of Virtue Restaurant, Daisy's Po' Boy and Tavern, Mustard Seed Takeout Kitchen, and Top This Mac and Cheese. What else we gotta add to that gumbo? It's one or other. It's real. It's real? Mm -hmm. Oh, it just needs to be stirred? Yes, sir. My man. I decided to invite friends from the chef's community into my home in the tradition of a red beans and rice dinner traditionally found in New Orleans. I grilled chicken, ash roasted rutabaga, roasted chicken. Additionally, I seared American red snapper. I did a lima bean and mustard green dish alongside of that with coconut rice. Ah, when I think back to what I saw most as a kid, it was Southern food. I feel very connected to that space when I'm cooking. I look to pay a lot of homage to those that cooked before me, to think who was the person that discovered collard greens and thought to cook them in a way that was healing and in a way that will provide a way of survival. The first thing I do when preparing chicken on the grill is I generally brine it for a day. I chose to use a Tabasco brine. It allows me to season the chicken really evenly. I take the backbone out because when grilling chicken, I like to have a flat surface, much like people would do if they were doing brick chicken. Bring the chicken up to room temperature. Then I move into lighting the grill, cooking logs down to coals, We brush the chicken with oil, season it lightly with salt and pepper, and I apply the chicken onto the grill, breast and leg side down. I was really lucky to get beautiful American red snapper. I prepared the snapper by filleting it off of the bone there's almost always still a few scales and usually the most unlikely thing for me to do at home, but it's one of those necessary evils. And the reason it's unlikely for me to do at home is because the scales get everywhere. Once the snapper's filleted and I've removed all visible scales, I check the fillets to make sure that there are no remaining bones. And if so, I use fish tweezers to remove those bones and then I portion the snapper into basically a pretty uniform size for a filet that doesn't really want to be uniform. I seasoned them with salt and pepper, seared them to get the skin crisp, and served them garnished with scallions. As a child, I was fun-loving, I was energetic, curious. I lived in a home that was safe 
that was encouraging, that contained rigor. I was working in kitchens as a means to an end, and I had the opportunity to meet a chef, Michael Cornick, and he was so passionate about food, it became infectious. I worked at MK for 20 years. Rutabagas always have a wax coating on them. And so I take the rutabaga and I lay them directly on top of the coals. And they look like charcoal by the time they're done. If I was to describe a rutabaga, I would describe it as what a turnip wants to be. Rutabagas have a natural sweetness to them. The rutabaga is then dressed with sunflower seeds, arugula, midnight moon cheese, which is a firm goat cheese. I generally soak my beans overnight. In this case, I was using dried lima beans. I started with diced onion, red bell pepper, and sliced garlic. I sweat the onions, the garlic, then I add the red bell peppers. At that point, I stir the beans in and I add turkey stock. I simmer the beans until they're about 80% done. At that point, I add enough mustard greens where there is about a 60% ratio of mustard greens to beans once they wilt. Hi, everyone. Hey, chef. How you doing, chef? Virtue, Daisy's, Mustard Seed Kitchen, and now Top This Mac and Cheese were all designed to fill a void. I strongly believed that the world was craving kindness and it continues to crave kindness. And we wanted to have a space that is considered safe space, that is culturally alive and vibrant, that tells the stories and the narrative of the black experience through food and music and textures and art and we wanted to harness that in one space. Hello, welcome to Daisy's Folk Wine Tavern. How you doing? How's it going, brother? I'm good, how are you? I'm great, I'm great. How are you enjoying your sandwich? Good, did you make this? We want places that feel inclusive. It's just surrounded by black culture. That's what sets the table. Well, I appreciate you, man. I, I know it's black on. I appreciate y'all, man. Thank you. I took a warm pan, I sweat diced sweet potatoes, added par-cooked Carolina gold rice, and I moistened that rice with coconut milk, folded in the coconut milk, loosened the rice with a little bit of the turkey stock that we had reserved, and finished it with salt and pepper. I thought, this particular meal was an incredible opportunity for me to invite friends from the chef's community into my home, to just let our hair down, get a chance to connect. You know, I think that people that are at your dinner table should be people that you respect. I think that's part of the experience. Oh, that's grandma dish right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, really, how many times do we get a chance to do this? No. Right. right. That's the other part. Right. So fellowship is important. We take a lot of pride in making sure that we leave the industry better than it was when we found it. And part of our contribution is making sure that young cooks can see chefs that look like them and owners and operators that look like them 
and an effort for us all to believe that, you know, the, the world is not one dimensional. It's not made for some and not others. And that, that the stigmas are put behind us. And that's important to me. <laughs> Thank you.